And I'm back now with John Branker, co-executive of Michael Jackson's estate, and Howard Weissman, Jackson's attorney. Howard, let me just bring you in here. Uh, obviously, fascinating conversation there with, with John. People didn't really understand, I don't think, just what a business empire Michael Jackson had amassed by the end. In all your experience of working in the entertainment industry, how did, how did Michael's business empire rank? Michael truly was one of a kind. There are very few legitimate icons in the entertainment business. A lot of people try to get to that level or are looked at in different ways. But Michael was really one of a kind. He had the ability to generate millions and millions of fans worldwide that converted to huge numbers. And we see that, unfortunately, post-death as well as when he was alive. Yeah, he was I mean, an is extraordinary it, individual. Is it, is it right to say, I don't want to be morbid about this, but is it right to say that there's an old sort of joke about this, that when entertainers die, that it's often their best career move because uh, billions and billions of their records get sold and so on. But there is a certain truth to that, isn't there? That if you look at Elvis or John Lennon and Freddie Mercury and so on, that their, their death can spark huge, huge sums of money coming into the state. Yeah, I, I think that's true. The catalog uh, sales spike for a while. What, what, what differentiates Michael from others, in my opinion, uh, the This Is It uh, record, or the This Is It film, for example, the This Is It CD, now the Cirque shows, he was able to create additional businesses well beyond the music, and that's unusual. And John, let me ask you, I mean, Michael was well known to be pretty profligate with his spending. How big a problem was that for him by then? I don't want you to get into the precise details of what debt he may or may not have had, but was his spending out of control, as people kept saying it was? Well, that was an area that uh, was handled by Michael's uh, business managers and accountants. Um, and Michael made a lot of money, and uh, I, I probably believe it's true that, that he spent a lot of money. Uh, but he left a lot behind. He had a lot to show for it. I mean, you worked on the Elvis estate briefly. I know that. Um, yes. How does this compare? Uh, the two great entertainers, solo artists. How do their estates compare in terms of how you manage them? Well, it's, it's hard to compare. Elvis uh, came up in a different era in the 50s. I, I was a big Elvis fan. It's one of the reasons I got in the music industry. But Michael, you know, went to the Barry Gordy Motown School of the music business and then learned from great teachers. And one of the things I found representing various members of the Hall of Fame is as the generations have gone by, musicians have become very much smarter. And so Michael, I think, learned from his predecessors, and, uh, and as did I. And so he was able to control his assets in a way that previous entertainers had not. And how fast have those assets appreciated since his death? Well, we've, you know, we've tried to, to do the right things. I think John McClain and I have had the advantage of having a decades-long relationship with Michael. Uh, John went to school with Michael and his brothers, uh, managed Michael at one point. I was a principal business advisor since 1980. So we kind of knew how Michael thought, what kind of choices he would make. I was familiar with the assets. So we've been able to make decisions that we think were true to Michael. So therefore, we hope we're adding value to, uh, to Michael's estate in, the, in that regard. It's not been without his problems, this estate, because both Catherine Jackson and Joe Jackson challenged the will quite early on. What was that all about? Why were the family unsettled by, by the will? The will was, was written in 2002, so a long time before he died. Well, I think, uh, I think they were ill-advised and the challenge was ill-conceived. Michael clearly appointed John McLean, John Branca to be the executors of his will, the trustees of his trusts, and ultimately the court rejected the challenge. The Court of Appeals rejected the, the challenge, and John McLean and John Branca are, in fact, the executors and the trustees. Uh, and am I right in thinking the estate's already petitioned to distribute $30 million to the Will's beneficiaries, who would be his immediate family and children? Yeah, it, yeah it's something we had planned on a year ago. It's only a preliminary distribution. Uh, the, the, you know, the court has a certain process we have to go through. You deal with IRS issues. Uh, state of California, estate issues, but ultimately uh, the executors, John Branca and John McLean, decided that it was time for a preliminary distribution, $30 million, 
went into Michael Jackson's family trust. And uh, John, I mean, presumably as the co-executor, would you have read the will to the family? Yes, I did, to Mrs. Jackson and several of Michael's siblings. I mean, a, a pretty extraordinary experience. How, how was that? Very emotional. Um, you know, Mrs. Jackson had lost her son. Um, Michael's brothers and sisters had lost a beloved brother. And we gathered at Jermaine's house and, uh, and read the will, and, and I left her with a copy of the will. Uh, I think we were all in a state of shock. Uh, no one could have anticipated Michael's passing. I mean, what was your first reaction, I guess, if you, did you know you were co-executors still? Were you aware that that 2002 will was still in play? No, not at all. Michael had a, a succession of attorneys and business advisors subsequently, and I, I did not know uh, which was the final will. Uh, we, we turned the will into the court, um, and uh, we did not know if there'd be another more recent will. And have you managed to, not patch things up, but have you managed to calm the family down now about your intentions being perfectly honorable in relation to the, the will and so on? Are they in a more relaxed frame of mind about it? I, I would think so. I would hope so. Uh, Michael's brother, Jackie, is a consultant to the estate, as is Michael's uh, nephew, Taj. And, of course, Mrs. Jackson and Michael's three children are the sole beneficiaries of the estate other than, of course, the contribution we will make to charity. We have another short break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about, in particular, the Cirque du Soleil project, which is probably the biggest thing that you sanctioned as a co-executor, and see what the plan is for that. John Branker and Howard Weisman. Uh, John, tell me about Cirque du Soleil, because your history with Michael and this particular show goes back, I think, to Santa Monica Pier. Is that right? Uh, that's true, Pierce. Um, I remember a night, I believe it was in 1989, where Michael and I went to the first ever Cirque du Soleil tent show, which was at the Santa Monica Pier. And what I remember about that night, we were in a van. And I was driving. And why we were in a van, I cannot remember. Michael had a nice car. I had a nice car. Michael, here was Michael, the biggest star in the world. And we went with no security. And I was so nervous driving Michael, I got lost on the 405 freeway. So we ended up getting to the Cirque show, and, and Michael was clearly captivated. So he said to me, Branka, we have to go backstage after the show. Of course, Michael. So we go backstage, and he wanted to meet the cast. And I will never, I can't tell who was more excited, Michael to meet the cast or the cast to meet Michael. <laughs> it was one of those ma magical nights. Um, and subsequently, Michael visited Montreal on more than one occasion to meet with the Cirque owner, Guy La Liberté. Uh, Michael was a big fan of Cirque. So John McClain and I knew we had to create a live show. Um, Barry Gordy called Michael the greatest entertainer who ever lived. So to do a live show properly, we knew it had to be something really special. I mean, you certainly couldn't put somebody up on stage to try to impersonate Michael. That would be absurd. So we considered the various alternatives, and lo and behold, we got a call from Guy Le Liberté, who said Cirque was interested in doing a Michael Jackson show. And if you've seen the Cirque du Soleil shows, they've created some of the greatest shows that have ever been made. So we figured this might be the perfect marriage. If you saw this as it, Pierce, you see what a perfectionist Michael was. And we see the same level of detail in Cirque du Soleil. So it seems like a, a, a match made in heaven. So the match, just to clarify, is a kind of fusion of Cirque du Soleil as we would know it, but mixed with Michael's music. Is that right? That's right. One of our key objectives is Cirque has a number of shows, and they're all outstanding. But we wanted to make sure this was a Michael Jackson show. Michael's fans want a Michael Jackson show. And Cirque was on board for that. And, and we've hired many people who collaborated with Michael. The director, Jamie King, danced with Michael. 
Uh, two of the choreographers, Travis Payne and the Talawega brothers, work with Michael. There's a live band in the show uh, run by Greg Fillingaines, who played on all of Michael's albums and toured with Michael. And so what you see, this is a, a traveling rock show that will travel to arenas throughout the world with live band, Michael's vocals, incredible visuals, and incredible choreography. And you'll come away seeing something that I don't think has ever been done before, a Michael Jackson show done by Cirque du Soleil. And in 2013, it goes to Vegas permanently, and there'll be a Michael Jackson museum. There'll be a, uh, another show that's created permanently and specifically for a theater in Las Vegas in 2013. Howard, let me bring you in here, because I, I, I think it's more appropriate to ask you about the ongoing trial with Conrad Murray, because you were the guy who represented Michael over the child abuse allegations in 1993. Um, what do you make of all this? The issue in this case will be did Conrad Murray engage in the appropriate standard of care for a physician in that situation. And I've read the same stuff you read about his defense. Uh, I've tried over 200 jury trials, so I, enough, I know enough to know you can't really predict it. The evidence will be what it is. But it seems to me pointing the finger at the victim is always an uphill battle. And that appears to be Dr. Murray's defense. What I hope personally is that the jury does the right thing. Many people have said to me that the catalyst for Michael's problems with painkiller addiction and sleep problems and so on was twofold. One was the horrific accident with the Pepsi commercial where he, his hair was set on fire and it caused him severe burning. And so he took the painkillers for that. But secondly, that the child abuse uh, allegations had a hugely detrimental effect on his health and on his sleep. You were obviously at the center of all that, Howard. What, what do you think of that? I, I think the pressures of any allegations, even though they're false and even though it turns out you're acquitted, put tremendous pressure on you. And I also think the demands of, of one's business could put pressures on you. I, I really am not privy to Michael's drug use. Again, only what I've read about and heard about. Either way, um, someone else pointing the finger at him as being responsible for his own death is a concept that I reject. Let me, John, finish with you. I, I, I saw Michael Jackson perform a couple of times live, and to me, he was the greatest entertainer that I ever saw. You've represented, as Howard has, many of the great entertainers in the world. What did you think of his status as a performer? I think it was uh, unparalleled. Um, it's very rare that you can see someone who could write the songs like Michael did, sing them with his vocal ability, choreograph them, produce them, and then go out and perform them. Anyone who could do any one of those things can be a star. Then you add in Michael's fashion sense and you have a one-of-a-kind superstar. Well, what do you think his legacy will be? As Barry Gordy said, the greatest performer who ever lived. Howard, what would you say? For me, when people ask me to describe Michael Jackson, I say push the play button on the video or on your iPod, and that says it all. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. To me, he was, he was the know, real you know, king of pop. <laughs> Absolutely. John, Howard, thank you both very much indeed. Thank, thank you. After the break, our exclusive with Michael Jackson's mother and his children as they attend the launch of the show, which is to keep the memory of their father alive. The impression of the show that it was fantastic. I thought it was uh, one of the best shows that I've seen. It was like amazing. I, it brought tears to my eyes. I, I almost cried. It was amazing. He would have thought it would have performed really well. It kept getting better and better. I'm his mother, so quite naturally. I just thought everything was good.